The Ohio Shakespeare Quarantine Radio Program starts now. Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Avon Quarto, and welcome to the Ohio Shakespeare Quarantine Radio Program, where we produce original works based on classic stories for your at-home entertainment. So grab your quarantine pal, your favorite adult beverage, or maybe a glass of chocolatey Ovaltine for the kiddos, and settle in for some old-fashioned radio play spookums. Tonight's tale is based on the story by Guy de Maupassant, adapted for our radio program by Tess Burglar. It is sure to remind us about the danger of greed and constantly reaching for what you don't have because, in the end, you might lose everything. Joining us tonight from the Ohio Shakespeare Festival Company are Samus Haddad as the narrator, Rachel Ines as Matilda, Rodney Rice as Michael, Holly Humes as Freya, and John Peters as the driver, the jewelers. And now, Ohio Shakespeare Festival presents Guy de Maupassant's The Necklace. She was one of those pretty and charming girls who are sometimes as if by a mistake of destiny, born in a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no means of being known, understood, loved, or wedded by any rich and distinguished man, and so she let herself be married to a little clerk at the Ministry of Public Instructions. She dressed plainly only because she could not dress well, and she was as unhappy as though she had really fallen from her proper station. She had no lack of natural fineness, instinct for what is elegant, or suppleness of wit, and these qualities in her mind made her the equal of the very greatest ladies. She dreamt of silent antechambers hung with ornamental tapestry lit by tall bronze candelabra. She dreamt of the long salons fitted up with silk, of delicate furniture carrying priceless curiosities, coquettish perfumed boudoirs made for talks at five o'clock with intimate friends, with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. When she sat down to dinner before the little round table covered with a tablecloth three days old opposite her husband, who uncovered the pot and declared with an enchanted air, Aha, my famous Instapot curry. Doesn't get better than that, am I right? She thought of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of delicate dishes served on marvelous plates. Babe? Huh? Curry? Oh, yeah, sure. You okay? Yeah, why? Because you look not okay. I'm fine. Okay, cool, just checking. Just tired, I guess. Distracted. Yeah, I get that. Cool if I turn on the TV? Sure thing. She had no dresses, no jewels, nothing. And those thoughts consumed her because she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that. She would so have liked to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. I declare bankruptcy! <laughs> That's okay. literally never Wendy. not funny. <laughs> Hot and juicy redhead. Are you, you sure you're okay, babe? What are you thinking about? Nothing, really. I'm good. Really. Huh. What's that? Freya. Oh, yeah? Haven't heard you mention her in a while. What's she up to? She had a friend, a former schoolmate who was rich now, and whom she did not like to go and see anymore because she suffered so much when she did. Apparently doing a sponsored glamping staycation. <laughs> what the crap is that? Like... Coleman sponsored a super fancy camping trip in the Adirondacks, and she's featuring it on her Insta. Let me see. Jesus. Is it still considered camping you have an espresso machine? 
Nope. It's considered glamping. Crazy. Kind of cool, though, that the whole influencer life actually took off for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, since I cook tonight, can you do the dishes? Yep. She suffered ceaselessly, feeling herself born for all the delicacies and all the luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her dwelling, from the wretched look of the walls, from the worn-out chairs, from the ugliness of the curtains. They tortured her and made her angry. But the next evening, her husband returned home with a triumphant air. Hey, I have a surprise for you. What is it? Open and see. The Honorable William Arden and Mrs. Arden request the pleasure of your company at the inaugural celebration of the governor and the constitutional officers of the state of Ohio. So cool, right? Instead of being delighted as her husband hoped, she threw the invitation on the table with disdain. What do you want me to do with this? But babe, I thought you'd be happy. It's really exclusive. I had to pull some serious strings at work to even be invited. Lots of famous people will be there. You love this kind of thing. Uh Uh-huh, okay. And what the crap am I supposed to wear to an actual black tie governor's ball? He had not thought of that. How about the dress you order for his wedding? You look great in that. (laughs) Wait, what? What's the matter? Nothing. It was a nice idea, but I have nothing I could possibly wear to this. Give the invite to someone else's wife who might actually be able to go without being a total embarrassment. Okay, okay. Uh, How much would it cost to get you a new dress you could wear? Maybe something you could wear again later? Something very simple? She reflected several seconds, making her calculations and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical man. Finally... She replied hesitatingly. I don't know exactly, but I think I could find something for like $800. Oof, okay. Uh, I have a little saved up for Brian's bachelor party in Vegas. I can make that happen. Oh my God, really? Yeah, sure. If it means that much to you, then yeah. Michael, thank you so much. Just make sure it's something you really love. Something that makes you happy. I will. I love you. The day of the ball drew near, and Matilda seemed sad, uneasy, anxious. Her dress was ready, however. She looked at it, hanging there. What's up? You don't look happy. Mm. Second thoughts on the dress? No. Then what's up? It bums me out not to have a single jewel, not a freaking single stone, nothing to wear with it. I'll just look stupid with a dress like this and no accessories. I almost wish I wasn't even going. Could we go to Kohl's or something and get you a bracelet or something? Uh, no. Wearing obviously fake jewelry is even more humiliating than wearing none. I just don't want to go. Forget it. Okay, no. Wait. Could you ask Freya if you can borrow something? Oh, wow. Actually, yeah. I never thought of that. She just did a sponsorship with Tiffany's. Perfect. The next day, she went to her friend and told her of her distress. Freya went to a wardrobe with a glass door, took out a large jewel box, brought it back, opened it, and said, Anything you want, love. Choose. Choose. She saw, first of all, some bracelets, then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian cross, gold and precious stones of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the glass, hesitated, and could not make up her mind to part with them, to give them back. I just can't choose. Do you have anything else? Yeah, definitely. I'm not sure what you're looking for. Can I see a pic of your dress? Yeah, here. Hmm. Oh, and here's the back. Oh, wait! I think I have the perfect thing. She pulled from a drawer a black satin box. Inside it was a superb necklace of diamonds. Oh my god. 
Her heart began to beat with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it around her throat and remained lost in the ecstasy at the sight of herself. Can you lend me this? I know it must be crazy expensive, but maybe if I borrow only this one thing? Yes, of course you can borrow it. That's why I showed it to you. Oh my god, thank you so much. I just, like, uh, thank you. She sprang upon the neck of her friend and kissed her cheek passionately. It's really not a big deal. No, it is. I will take such good care of it, I promise. And I'll give it back to you right after the ball. No rush. Have so much fun. Take pics. Oh, for sure. I'm actually totally jealous. I wish I was going. See, this is how it usually feels to be me. Maddie, I know my life has kind of blown up, but I- No, sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I'm just super grateful. Love you. Love you too. While we might not be stuck in our homes as often as we were, we know that more of us are still staying in more than we used to. If you're looking for a way to safely break up that monotony, this word from our home theater may help. Hi, I'm Tess Burglar, Associate Artistic Director of the Ohio Shakespeare Festival, and I wanted to take a moment to let you know what's going on now that we are back to performing live at the theater. With safety precautions in place, Ohio Shakespeare welcomes you back to live performances at Greystone Hall this 2022, beginning with Arthur Miller's classic American drama, All My Sons, performing for three weekends, March 10th through the 27th. It's a stunning, heartwarming, heartbreaking show that is really not to be missed. I just sat in on a rehearsal today and truly, wow, the cast is really phenomenal, something really special. And I'm allowed to say that for this one because I'm not involved in the project at all. So I'm an objective viewer. Market price tickets are always available for our shows, but don't forget about our $15 preview night tickets, our pay-what-you-will performance on the first Sundays, and uh, for this show only, all gallery-level student tickets are only $5 for any night of the run. So I hope to see you soon at the theater. You can get tickets at ohioshakespeare.com sons, or give us a call at the box office at 330-5-SHAKES. That's 330-5-S-H-A-K-E-S. And now, the conclusion of The Necklace. The day of the ball arrived. Matilda made a great success. She was prettier than them all. Elegant, gracious, smiling, and crazy with joy. All the men looked at her, asked her name, endeavored to be introduced. They all wanted to waltz with her. (laughs) She danced with intoxication, with passion made drunk by pleasure, forgetting all in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success, in a sort of cloud of happiness, composed of all this admiration, of all these awakened desires, and of that sense of complete victory. She went away about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted anteroom with three other gentlemen whose wives were also having a good time. Babe. Babe. Wake up. Uh, huh? What? Let's get an Uber. I'm ready to go. Holy crap. Is it really four in the morning? Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I guess it is. Here, I've got your coat. Uh, no way. I can't wear that with this dress. Babe, it's like 10 degrees outside. You have to wear a coat. Okay, yeah. Just let's be quick. He threw over her shoulders the coat which he had brought. Modest wraps of common life whose poverty contrasted with the elegance of the dress. She felt this and wanted to escape so as not to be remarked by the other women who were enveloping themselves in costly furs. Crap. There are no Ubers out. Try Lyft. Yeah, nothing. Crap. I'll go out and see if I can flag a cab. You wait here. But she did not listen to him and rapidly descended the stairs. When they were in the street, they did not see a carriage. They began to look desperately for one, shouting after the cabmen whom they saw passing by at a distance. They began to walk in the direction of home, in despair, shivering with cold. At last... They found on the quay one of those ancient noctambulant coupés which, exactly as if they were ashamed to show their misery during the day, 
are never seen around the city until after nightfall. Need a ride? You with Uber? Not exactly. Lyft? Nah, man. You want a ride or not? <sighs> Screw it. Yeah. It took them to their door, and once more, sadly, they climbed up homeward. Was it everything you'd hoped it would be? Yeah. It was amazing. But all was ended for her. And as for him, he reflected that he must be at work at the ministry at ten o'clock. She removed the wraps which covered her shoulders before the glass so as once more to see herself in all her glory. But suddenly, she uttered a cry. <gasps> she no longer had the necklace around her neck. Jesus, what? What's wrong? I... I... I've lost Freya's necklace. What? How? No way. Check your pockets. Oh my god. Oh my god. And they looked in the folds of her dress, in the folds of her cloak, in her pockets, everywhere. You sure you had it on when you left the ball? Yes, I felt it when we were walking out. But if you had lost it in the street, we would have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, probably. Did you see the number or, like, the company logo? No, and you didn't either, I'm guessing. No. They looked thunderstruck at one another. At last, Michael put on his clothes. We'll have to go back on foot. I'll just retrace our steps. She sat waiting on a chair in her ball dress, without the strength to go to bed, overwhelmed, without fire, without a thought. Her husband came back about seven o'clock. Did you find it? No, nothing. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Next, he went then to police headquarters, to the newspaper offices to offer a reward. He went to the cab companies, everywhere, in fact, whether he was urged by the least suspicion of hope. She waited all day in the same condition of mad fear before this terrible calamity. Michael returned at night with a hollow, pale face. He had discovered nothing. You have to tell her it's lost. I can't do that. There really isn't another option. Michael, when I tell you I'd rather die, I'm being totally serious. I cannot tell her I lost it. I just can't. It's too embarrassing. <sighs> Then you have to text her and say that you've broken the clasp and you're having it repaired. Okay, yeah. But, like, then what? I don't know. But at least we have some time to think. Okay. She said, no problem. <laughs> at the end of a week... They had lost all hope, and Michael, who had aged five years, declared, There's really nothing else we can do. I won't tell her. I know. I know. I mean, we're just going to have to replace it. Oh. Wow. Can we even do that? What other option are you giving me? The next day, they took the box which had contained it, and they went to the jeweler whose name was found within. He consulted his books. I'm afraid I've never sold a necklace like the one you're describing. I do sell these cases. If you'd like another case, I can show them to you just over here. Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, consulting their memories, both of them sick with chagrin and anguish. They found, finally, in a shop in the city's capital, a string of diamonds which seemed to them exactly like the one they looked for. Oh my god, Michael. That's it. Are you sure? Yes, completely. Pardon me, sir? Yes, how may I help you both today? Engagement ring hunting? <laughs> uh, no, thanks. How much is this necklace here? Ah, uh, gorgeous piece that. Only a handful of them made, from what I understand. Would you like to try it on, ma'am? Uh, no, thanks. We just need to know how much it costs. As I say, this is one of our more special pieces. Really, an heirloom piece. We really just want to know the price. He told them it was worth more than they made in a year, by far.
So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet. They possessed some inherited money which Michael's father had left him. They would borrow the rest. They did borrow, asking a thousand of one bank, five hundred of another, five here, three there. They gave notes, took up ruinous obligations, dealt with usurers and all manners of lenders. They compromised all the rest of their lives, risked their signatures without even knowing if they could meet it. And, frightened by the pains yet to come, by the black which was about to fall upon them, by the prospect of all the physical privation and all of the moral tortures which they were yet to suffer, he went to get the new necklace, putting down upon the merchant's counter the collected money. When Matilda took back the necklace, Freya said to her, Oh, wow! I forgot you even had this. <laughs> She did not open the case as Matilda had so much feared. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she not have taken Matilda for a thief? In the years that followed, she would come to know the horrible existence of the truly needy. She took her part surprisingly with heroism. That dreadful debt must be paid, and she would pay it. They changed their lodgings. They rented an attic in another family's home. She came to know what heavy housework meant and the odious chores of the kitchen. She washed the dishes, using her rosy nails on the greasy pots and pans. She washed the dirty linen, the shirts, and the dishcloths, which she dried upon a line. She carried the slops down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping for breath at every landing. And, dressed like a woman of the people, she went to the fruiterer, the grocer, the butcher, her basket on her arm, bargaining, insulted, defending her miserable money penny by penny. Each month they had to meet some notes, renew others, obtain more time. Her husband worked in the evening, and this life lasted for ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid back everything, everything, with the rates of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. Matilda looked old now. She now looked strong and hard and rough, with mousy hair, skirts askew, and red, raw hands. But sometimes, when her husband was late at the office, she sat down near the window and she thought of that one gay evening of long ago, of that ball where she had been so beautiful and so feted. <laughs> what would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How life is strange and changeful. How little a thing is needed for us to be lost or to be saved. But one Sunday... Having gone to take a walk to refresh herself from the labor of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Freya, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Matilda felt moved. Was she going to speak to her? <laughs> yes, certainly. And now that she had paid her debt, she was going to tell her friend all about it. Why not? She went up to her. Hi, Freya. It's good to see you again. Hello. The other, astonished to be familiarly addressed by this plain stranger, did not recognize her at all, and stammered, uh, Sorry, I think you have me mistaken for someone else. No, I don't. Oh, do you follow my Insta? No, it's me, Matilda. Oh my god, Maddie! How are you? I barely recognized you. Yes, I've had some hard days since I've seen you. Hard years, in fact. And I just wanted you to know that. Because honestly, if it wasn't for you, it wouldn't have been like that. I could have led a normal life. If it wasn't for me? What in the world do you mean? Do you remember that diamond necklace you lent me for the governor's ball ten years ago? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, I lost it. What do you mean? You brought it back. 
I brought you back another one just like it, and I've been paying back that debt for the past ten years. And now it's done. It's all paid back. And I guess I just wanted you to know the truth now, so I can move on with my life and never think about it again. You say that you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine, and that's what you returned to me? Yes. You never noticed it then. I found one almost exactly the same. And she smiled with joy, which was proud and naive at once. Her friend, strongly moved, took her two hands. Oh, my poor Maddie. I, I don't know how to say this. What? The necklace I lent you was made of glass. It was worth at most a few hundred dollars. This concludes tonight's broadcast of The Necklace, adapted for our radio production by Tess Burglar from Guy de Maupassant. We would also like to recognize Technical Director Buddy Taylor, Associate Artistic Director and Sound Designer Tess Burglar, and Trevor Buda for writing and creating the original theme music for the Quarantine Radio program. Keep an eye out for these all-original classic radio plays live on our Facebook page. You can also listen to them at any time thereafter on our website at www.ohioshakespeare.com or find them at soundcloud.com slash ohio-shakespeare-festival. These radio plays will remain free to the public and Ohio Shakespeare will continue to pay our collaborating artists. If you would like to support these efforts, please consider donating directly on our website at ohioshakespeare.com slash donate. Look for more radio plays later in 2022. Until then, come see us live at the theater. You can always close your eyes and imagine that we are on the radio. Also, watch our social media closely on March 1st for an important announcement. This is Avon Quarto and everyone at Ohio Shakespeare saying thanks, thanks, and ever thanks. <laughs>